if you haven't been with us for the past two weeks and you're used to coming in about this time of year and hearing the story from either Matthew or Luke or maybe even John of the birth of Jesus, you're finding that this year we're doing a little differently. Matthew and Luke, on our Christmas Eve service, will be read. No doubt about it. But the Christmas story is found out throughout the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. We saw in our first Sunday together for Advent that when God was cursing the serpent, he was also promising the Messiah. The birth of the one who would put an end to Satan's reign. Then last week we saw how God spoke to Moses to clarify who this Messiah would be. What he would be like. One who spoke the truth. Why? Because he is the truth. We got out of the Old Testament. We are now in the New. And we know we're not going to the Gospels. We're going to Paul's writings. This is our first one. And we do actually see a small hint of the Gospel story. Or nativity. At the right time, he was born of a woman. Ta da! That's a, no, that's not it. Um, but I want to actually continue on off of what we did with the, the kids this morning. We look to this um, nativity. Whether this one or ones we have at home, whether there be plaster of Paris, plastic. Uh, silhouettes, whatever. As believers, we ooh and awe ah over it. It reminds us of the love that God poured out for us in becoming human and dwelling among us. But there are people in this world, not only Herod, who look at that and at least do not feel that same emotion. They might feel actually jealousy. They might feel many different things, but ooing and aahing and appreciation is not it. For Herod, it was jealousy. His kingdom was threatened. Would he stay on the throne? But for others, they see this baby, any baby, and they feel threatened. I'm talking about those who make up about 147 million of our 7.7 .7 billion individuals on the face of the earth. This 147 million, or the orphans of the world. Now, these individuals came to be as orphans, not because they chose to. Oh, yeah, oh, sign me up. I want to be an orphan. Some of it be, because the parents were underage themselves, teenage pregnancy. And their grandparents says, you got to get rid of this child. You're too young. Others, it might be that they're welcomed in, but either as a single parent or both parents are unable to care for themselves let alone have enough financially to care for a young one. So they give them up for the adoption, hoping that this other family will be able to provide and shower love, which they would like to do, but are unable to. You have those two, which young ladies who are raped. And they like the idea of seeing a newborn. But the horror of the rape whenever they see that child flashes back before their eyes. So giving it up for adoption so that they know a life has been brought but the rape isn't still fresh in their memory. But also, again, those who maybe are brought up into a loving household that maybe are killed. Auto accident. Someone breaks into the house and kills mom and dad. The kids are now left as orphans. 
no matter how or why they are orphans, they are. But this is not where they want to remain. If all possible, all orphans would like to be reunited with their natural mom and dad. They want to be known, loved by the ones who help bring them into the world. If that's not possible, find someone who will love us. Someone who will watch over us, care for us. As one orphan stated, the greatest joy that they would love to be is that on the day that they walk down and get their diploma on graduation day, they know they have someone rooting for them, cheering them on, and loving them in the audience. Yes, they may have received a great achievement, whether through high school or even college or even a doctorate, but knowing that person or people it means all the more to them. The desire there is expressed that it's that love which they value so much. Be part of something even larger, a family. And there are probably a million other emotions which they go through, and I can't describe them all. But still to know that they are loved and accepted. That would be a great thing. In this day and age, you think adoption might be easy. After all, it's only 2% of the world's population are orphans. 2%. But still, that's, like I said, 147 million. Keith and Connie, are you ready to adopt 147 million? <laughs> okay, 146 million, Karen and I will do the other million. How's that? Well, even things out for it. Uh, we would love to. But when you also consider just going through the process of adoption today in America, is at the bare minimum $40,000. That's a lot of money. Then the time of going through the process, being screened, finding that right relationship with a child. Many people consider it. Actually, I'm not sure how they figured this one, but Studies have shown that 81.5 million individuals have considered the idea of adoption. But because of those factors of costs, time, and other things, they choose not to. However, I am grateful that we live in the country which we do live. In all the world, we are the number one at adopting. We as a country, adopt over 50% of all the orphans that are adopted. The next four countries, Spain, France, Italy, and Canada, make the next 30%. The other countries make up the last 20. But we are doing a great job. We could do more. We could encourage others. To do that. But the sad part is, we can only do so much. And as we try to do what we can, people fall through the cracks. Every year, 23,000 children actually age out of the foster program. They go through life without knowing a relationship of a mother and a father. They do not know what family life means and therefore have a harder time when they become parents themselves in knowing how to raise a family. They haven't had a role model. But what does all this got to do with our newborn baby Jesus? Newborn babies at all? Well, if you're just looking at a newborn baby, let's negate that word Jesus right now. If you're an orphan and you see a family coming home with their newborn, does that make you full of glee? Happiness? Usually jealousy. They're the lucky ones. 
Why did they get to be born and accepted? And I have no one. So there's jealousy. You may not act upon it, but it's there. <clears throat> also, because if you're an orphan and you're considering this, <coughs> your age is throwing something in here. Because there is a shared knowledge amongst orphans. It's not told to them, but they know. That the closer you are to being a newborn, <laughs> the greater likelihood you will be adopted. If you are just a few months old, you're like 80-some percent chance of being adopted. But as time wears on, whether you're two, you're still doing pretty good. Two years. Six, you're, you're dropping them down. But it seems like as soon as you hit seven, that incline Seven is like, well, they're developed. They don't even know who they are. They don't really need them. We adopt the younger ones. So the older ones do not know what family is. And, they, and whenever they see a newborn, they're going to be adopted before I am. Again, jealousy. It's just sneaking in. And hurt is there. And a third option, which could take place less probable but still possible. You have a couple who is looking. They cannot have a child of their own. They even are approved to adopt, and they are starting a relationship with a child as a potential child of their own. Then they find out they are pregnant. But they can only afford one child. Who will it be? Will it be the one in the womb? Or is it the one that they've been talking to? We know it will be the one in the womb. If they could, they would adopt both. But if it had to come down to it, it would be the one in the womb. They believe that this child that who they've been talking to has such a great personality. That next family is just around the corner. But there's no proof. So again, jealousy. When an orphan sees a newborn. It's how the world works. For when we look at childbirth, it's when you are normally unable to have children or are no longer able to have children that adoption is considered and is pursued. Now, there are couples who do have children of their own and adopt on top of that. And I am saying, I'm grateful. I've seen this in this community uh, all the over. You know how to love. You know how to reach out. You find children who were not born to you and consider them as your own. I have not seen as many numbers as I've seen here. So this is not a sermon on being adopting or going out and adopting. But you'll find out this is a sermon about that you are being adopted. Because when it comes to it, it's usually it, when the world looks at it, you have a choice. A birth or adoption. One or the other. Jesus says, well, first the world says, if you have birth, adoption is not there, but it'll, it'll drop. But Jesus says, through my birth, your adoption is available. Instead of an either or, he made it a both and. My birth is bringing you into my father's family. It is that welcoming birth. It is a birth in which if children knew the full story. This Galatians passage, it would show them that he is not our enemy. He is not someone to be jealous of, but someone to love and adore. 
For when we talk about the coming of Christ and what he has done for us, one of the things which we talk about is how Jesus has redeemed us. We sing it. Redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Before Christ came, we were slaves to sin. Satan was our master. And we cannot break free from his chains over us. Sin was our taskmaster, just forcing us to do the same things over and over again, more evil and evil each and every time. We tried to stop and try to live righteously, but we could not comply. That sin nature just drove us. <coughs> and if we even tried to escape, we found there wasn't a way of escape. But then came Christ. He came as that infant, but then died on that cross, and rose again to pay the cost to free us and to let us be free, but not totally free. Instead of now being servants of sin, we are servants of the Most High. This is a far better position. We are no longer in drudgery. We are no longer being beaten. We are loved. But it did not stop there. Our passage this morning talks about that he not only called us, <laughs> he not only redeemed us, but he adopted us. Instead of leaving us as servants, he said, I want to make you my child. A servant does not inherit as my child. All this kingdom, all this glory, all this love is for you. You are that beloved child. You're not just the servant who tends to make sure heaven looks polished when Christ walks down the roadway. You are walking with your Savior. You have this relationship. As man, we have been told that we are already the children of God. We were created in His image. But we've been tarnished and therefore we went into prison of sin. Been redeemed. But Paul, when he is at this point, is now changing the idea of what it means to be a son of God. Not just a created being, but an intimate relationship. So that's why he says there in this very passage that we can now cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is a very familiar word of that relationship between father and child. It's not just my father, the great one, the one who puts the roof over my head. No, he is my daddy. The one who I have a close relationship with. He calls and I feel allowed me to sit on his knee and talk with him. That's the type of relationship he is now often. Jesus may be the firstborn, but he wants my, my ear, he wants to give me his ear as well. He loves me that much. We who were outcasts and enemies of the Almighty are now considered his children and will receive the inheritance of his kingdom and the preciousness, that sweet preciousness his presence in our lives. That's Christmas. Christ came. We may swap gifts at Christmas, but we receive the presence of God. On earth, when a child is born to a loving couple, adoption is, like I said, usually put aside or maybe even forgotten. Orphans will feel rejected and unloved. There can be a sense of jealousy over a newborn. Yet when God gave his son to be brought into the world, he also brought adoption papers for everyone else. For all who will accept the gift who is lying in that manger, the family of God is waiting for you. God has already sent the gift, Jesus. 
and Jesus has already paid the price by his blood on Calvary. And the Holy Spirit invites you to accept the adoption, and the church, your church family, is ready to embrace and welcome you. Why? Because we're adopted too. We know what it's like to be without Jesus, to be feeling unloved, uncertain, not knowing who we are in this world. Jesus gave us that adoption. And by our relationship now with the Father, we know who we are. We have joy. We have love. We know who, how things work. God is there. Now, whether we have grown up as a natural child of two parents, a single parent, foster parents, or even adopted parents, God has one more family for you to join. His. Are you a part of it? Let me tell you, the adoption process has already begun. The papers were drafted in that stable. They were signed on the cross. They were sealed at the empty tomb. <clears throat> Paperwork's done, folks. As a child, all you have to do is accept. William, he's down on his knees saying, I've done all the work. Will you come in? Be my child so I can love you. That's Christmas. The family is here. Whether you want to just be part of God's overarching church and become a child of God, we can help you with that. If you want something even close knit by joining this family, we can help you with that. And no, we don't have any long, drawn-out rituals or legalized statements with the triplicate or anything for you to sign out. Very simple. Declare unto us what you like, and we'll sign it and sign it. Because God did it for us. He starts out with an open arms and then brings it around you. Christmas is about adoption. We talk about the birth. But that birth brought adoption to you. Let us pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for this one birth. Normally it seems like these two things are at odds. You are brought in this world by parents who loved and accepted you, or finding yourself adrift because no one could care for you or wanted to care for us. But you never stopped caring. So you sent Jesus. One born to be the adoption for the rest of us. <coughs> Dear Lord, we no longer have to stray, wondering if we have love, knowing who we are, what our relationship with you, or what our purpose is. You just say, Come to me. I've already got the paperwork done. <coughs> Help us to just come running. Christ's name, amen. Shall we stand and sing our closing hymn?